Good evening. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to more broadly acknowledge First Nations people across Australia for their continuing patience, generosity and spirit that contribute so richly to our life and culture across Australia. Welcome to you all. I'm Sharon Beale, the CEO of GML Heritage. Thank you for joining us this evening online and in person here on Gadigal land at the Mint in Sydney. This is the fourth in our First Nations speaker series. And the series is a collaboration amongst GML Heritage, the Research Centre for Deep History at ANU and Sydney Living Museums. It was designed to create space for a range of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to talk about history, heritage and culture. And we endeavour to support and encourage listening, learning, hearing and unlearning. Tonight, we're absolutely delighted to welcome special guest speaker, Dr. Terry Janke, who will be presenting Working with Indigenous Culture and Intellectual Property, an Introduction to Two True Tracks ICIP protocols. Dr. Janke is a lawyer and an international authority on Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. She established her award-winning legal firm, Terry Janke and Company in 2000. And today she has a broad and diverse range of clients from non-Indigenous and Indigenous creatives, entrepreneurs, businesses, and government departments across Australia and beyond. On top of that, Terry is an author of fiction and non-fiction, and her most recent book, True Tracks, Respecting Indigenous Knowledge and Culture, came out in 2021, published by New South Publishing, and it's been published with outstanding reviews. The format for this evening is that Terry will present her talk, then after Terry's talk, we'll have time for Q&A. Those of you that are at home or online, if you have questions throughout Terry's talk, please pop them into the chat box and they'll come through to us um, at the end of the evening. If you're in the audience, we'll have roaming mics and Ben and Charlotte will be in the room. So if you have a question, please raise your physical hand and they'll come to you, wait for the microphone, ask your question, and hopefully we'll have a continuing conversation at the end of Terry's talk. I feel this is a really profoundly important topic for all of us as we walk, work towards strengthening and improving our approaches and understanding of Indigenous knowledges and cultures centred by and grounded in ethical and respectful engagement and practice. Over to you, Terry. Debbie Key, good evening everybody. Thank you, Sharon, uh, for your introduction. And thank you, and Charlotte Beacon, and GML, and ANU, and Sydney Living Museums for having me here today. And thank you all for coming out in the cold for December weather and rain to be here. And for everyone online, thank you for coming today. I'd like to start by acknowledging country. And today, uh, we're on Gadigal country, we're rain. And uh, I acknowledge the traditional owners here where we work, play and live. And I acknowledge elders past and present. And I celebrate the land and seas and the skies where we are. And I work in Bidjigal country. Uh, I um, have a team, Terry Janke and company, who I'm showing here. We're celebrating our 21 year anniversary uh, this year. Uh, I'm a Woodathi and Merriam and Yarakana woman. I was born in far north Queensland, so uh, I come from way up north, uh, my heritage even further. Um, I lived in Canberra for a while on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and then moved to Sydney to do my law degree here at the University of New South Wales, um, uh, where I did my um, undergraduate degree, but I also did my PhD at the ANU and I acknowledge the ANU there having done some work for them. But um, 
why did I uh, become a lawyer? It was quite an unlikely story, and I wanted to share that because I'm talking about a little bit about True Tracks and how uh, someone who, uh, you know, an eight-year-old girl who really sort of didn't know where she fit into the world, you know, it was uh, Indigenous kids always put into remedial classes, not really knowing what they would want to do. What would I do growing up and then, you know, where would I be? Uh, I would never have guessed it would have been a lawyer. And my journey there was um, uh, via, um, I guess, through uh, the teen years, learning about the absence. Uh, oh, well, you know, you, you're impacted by um, racism as you grow up and the absence of the truth telling and the history of Indigenous people in uh, spaces and in libraries and art galleries or uh, in the books that we read. And so as I'm learning that as a kid, it, it gets you to feel a little bit invisible. And then when you get to be a teenager and you're thinking about your identity, what will you be? And I became very vocal then about social justice and I really wanted to do something. I didn't know what it was. Uh, and then I thought being a lawyer would be cool and I could do something like that. There were some great lawyers. Pat O'Shane was a lawyer. Uh, Bob Blair thought I could have a pathway there and followed my sister into law school. And it, I thought it would be great. I'd go through and I'd be just like those lawyers on LA Law or whether it's you know Law and Order. It was one of those law television drama shows where people get dressed up, drive fast cars, and they always win their cases. I wanted to be like that, but um, you know, when I got to law school and I'm there, you go. I, I was doing an internship, and I'd go with a uh, team and sit up there and be mistaken for the judge. By the judge, should be mistaken for the judge now, thinking like a boss already. <laughs> but no, in those days, I would be mistaken for the defendant, and I thought, what the hell am I doing here? It was not the area of law that I wanted to be in. It was not the career very white male profession it was at the time. I'm talking for the young ones, it was in the 80s. And I had a break. It's also known as dropping out, but it was actually a time for me to think about what I would do because I went to the Australia Council for the Arts and a really good place to, um, for me to reconnect with uh, Indigenous people, doing artistic and creative things. And I really connected and then thought about copyright I was very influenced by um, uh, some, a senior woman who was running a case at the time and drew the connection between the gaps in copyright and then I ended up going back to law school and focusing on intellectual property, which everyone was surprised at because they thought, oh gee, now Terry thinks she's an intellectual, but there's not much property that Indigenous people have. But I was telling them about intellectual property and what that was. And for me, um, my career then was to think about how intellectual property as a concept that grew out of supporting Western knowledge systems to think about how indigenous knowledge would fit into it or really be recognised fully within that structure. And that was the work of indigenous cultural and intellectual property that began. And so, um, what is intellectual, what is Indigenous cultural and intellectual property? Well, um, it is Indigenous people's rights to their heritage and uh, that um, includes many things but it, it springs from work that I did in um, the late 1990s and uh, I was able to think about this in a deep way when the firm that I was working for at the time Michael Frankel and Company did a project which ended up being the Our Culture, Our Future report. And it was great. We won the tender which was put out by the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. And it was uh, about a two and a half year, three year project. Really, I had two children at the time. It was quite crazy. And um, I sometimes think, is this my third child? Um, that I had, um, but um, it 
had a lot of investment of my time in it, but um, not just my time, but many people contributed to it. So we had an Indigenous reference group. We had uh, people like Russell Taylor, who is the principal of the um, IATSIS at the time. There was uh, Commissioner Delaney from IATSIC that was involved, and a whole group of people like Bromwyn Bancroft, Henrietta Marry, um, were involved in putting together the, the report. Um, it ended up being very big and it pieced out uh, what Indigenous people wanted in terms of rights to their heritage. And we used the language Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. It came from the 1990s draft of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. That language has changed in its final cut of the declaration, but we still use it in Australia. And you hear people say ICIP or ICIP. Um, it is the language we use. And this report was probably where it really got um, strength. We got about 80 submissions to that report. It breaks um, down into three parts. The first part is looking at the rights and what that is and what, um, you know, uh, Indigenous people see it as. And the second bit was to look at the law, how those rights are realised in the existing legal landscape as it was then. So it covered IP laws like copyright, trademarks, patents, plan breeders' rights, but it also looked at heritage and it even went into non-legal measures. And, um, and then the third part was to make recommendations. And the first recommendation was to have a new law, a, a standalone, sui generis, separate law that recognised Indigenous people's ongoing right to the heritage. And it was a right that people were calling for, and this report came out of, um, you know, in its setting in the, in the 90s, was following on from, we had the Marbo case, um, do people remember the year? Around 1992, 1993, we were talking about, you know, the 10-point plan and there was a social justice package. So this was all supposed to be part of that and the changes to the law, but there was a change in government and it wasn't really taken up in terms of uh, putting uh, a new law in, into um, act, to enact new laws. So... Um, uh, it's still useful, though. I do, if you do have copies or can have a look at that report, it's still useful to look at, even though it is uh, very old. But what is Indigenous cultural and intellectual property? Well, it is everything that Indigenous people want to uh, express their connection and identity um, to land, each other, um, to seas, and it's constantly evolving. So that's a new concept to think of if um, you're looking at it being, um, you know, things that are connected to place. It's communal and it's living, constantly evolving. People are, it's a practice and it's culture by practice. So you have things like at 11 o'clock, literary, performing and artistic works. And people are probably familiar that you say, oh yes, Aboriginal people share their stories as art and they might tell stories, dreaming stories and song lines. So they're familiar with that, that's heritage. But there's also documentation of Indigenous people's heritage. So Indigenous people have been written about for many years or government records and archival material contain a lot of Indigenous cultural and intellectual property, whether it's person's history, languages, for example, are, are recorded a lot or stories people are saying or ceremonies that might have been captured in films or sound recordings. That's the documentation of Indigenous people's heritage. Indigenous scientific and ecological knowledge is also a category, and that would be knowledge of plants, animals. You see that being used a lot now in bush foods, uh, environmental management. People probably have seen after the fires the um, increased interest in cultural fire management practices that is occurring. So that sort of thing is there. And um, the patenting or even, you know, applying for plant breeders' rights in Australia and internationally is a big problem for Indigenous people and um, it's called like biopiracy where it occurs without authorisation. Cultural property is in the group as well and cultural property includes artefacts, I guess is the word that a museum might use, but it might be an item that's in a collection uh, and people 
have live, living people have a relationship with that. Indigenous people will call those things treasures rather than it being a relic that um, has no connection to living people. And within our um, practice, I guess, uh, it, museums have sort of isolated that from the objects. So reconnecting becomes important. And Indigenous people call for repatriation of items, but also wanting to know what's in those collections. We have a movable cultural property there, and that's land and sites. And it's not just sacred sites, although people may be familiar with saying, oh, that's a women's site, men's sacred site. You may have been to Uluru and seen the signs where you can or cannot film. But it actually also includes all sites. You know, Indigenous people have connection to all country. And um, so immovable cultural property is in there. And then Indigenous ancestral remains. Our ancestors were collected for scientific study and their body parts were um, taken all around the world. So that becomes an important thing for return of our ancestors, their spirits to country. And many um, uh, people, we don't know where they come from. No one put their names or their, where they came from. And it becomes a very, very sad story for the, the families or, or you know, um, those spirits uh, lay um, un at unrest. And then we have languages as a subset too. And if we think of how many languages were spoken on this country um, on contact, people are estimating between 350 to 500, but there were many different languages. The local language here, um, where I come from, there were many. But um, languages are um, in a state of revival and many different um, groups um, are working hard to do that. Some are still living speakers, but many are working uh, with linguists and revitalising that from records. But language issues come up where people are using languages for uh, company names or patents, sorry, trademarks for new products. And also, you know, when you're naming buildings or national parks or suburbs, stuff like that come up. Are you thinking about the context? because all of this comes from place, it's communal, it's living and it's cultural. And if Indigenous people are to engage with it and we recognise and respect their rights of to, of, uh, to uh, have this Indigenous cultural and intellectual property right, it's about having that ability for them to own and maintain and control it. And they have roles and responsibilities as uh, the Indigenous inheritors of that knowledge. So it's being passed on through the years and consultation and consent becomes the means of practice and learning. So if you think of it in the ways that Indigenous people might walk country or share knowledge through art practice or through dance or through sitting around the campfire, those sort of roles and responsibilities might hit people at parts of their lives as you know, young people moving through the journey of life. And these cultural connections remain forever. Um, and they're also, you know, there may be rules around sacred, sacred men's business, but also just about rules for it to stay connected to people. So if we think of that as a different model of a Western knowledge system that sees things as being, you know, um, uh, once they're in the public domain freely, it, it causes you to think about how knowledge and the sharing of knowledge takes place. And the scope of the problem, I guess, with Indigenous cultural and intellectual property points to um, things that occur outside of these um, cultural practices. And it is misappropriation of Indigenous cultural and, it, cultural and intellectual property that is occurring here. And knowledge and cultural expression is being taken without that connection and without benefit sharing and what is the impact of that? Well, it takes away that cultural responsibility for Indigenous people uh, and um, it demeans cultural practices. So it is harming culture. And if we don't restore it, it's, it's going to continue. So um, reinstating those practices is about strengthening cultural practice. There is also sacred and secret knowledge being disrespected. 
So those rules need to come back into play. And then if we think about uh, an economic argument, and that is an underpinning of intellectual property laws, that there are economic rights for creators, but for Indigenous people too, uh, there are economic rights for them to, um, when they share their Indigenous cultural and intellectual property, that they should benefit in it. And it's sort of like unjust, unjust enrichment to just take those ideas. So we have these unfair copycats occurring and people probably have seen a lot about the overseas trinkets that are made in uh, overseas countries and they're brought into Australia and they compete with legitimate Indigenous produced items. So that those unfair copycats are in the market. But there's also thinking about how the taking of Indigenous knowledge and not allowing the sharing of benefits to how that may have an economic impact. And then with the application of laws, uh, IP laws aren't adequate to protect Indigenous knowledge because the premise on which they're built are really Western knowledge focused and IP, IP protects these um, individual uh, creations, properties. They're looking for one author and um, it, it allows, it has rules around deeming who is the owner and that has resulted in the taking away and disempowerment of Indigenous people's knowledge. And that's created what I call a history of mistrust. So that actually then caused, you know, even if you want to do it legitimately and you're walking into a community, people are saying, well, the last experience that we had was not very good, we don't want to share. So we have that occurring. And um, there's really quite good justifications for that in, given the past history. So if we move to think about uh, an intellectual property framework, um, which actually is imposed on an Indigenous knowledge system because they're laws that vest, well, if we put copyright there, um, you know, an intellectual property is a group of laws. Copyright um, is one of them, but patents, plant breeders, right and trademarks all require registration. But the registrations are occurring and Indigenous people don't know what's being registered. It's something that's between the applicant and, you know, IP Australia. But the copyright system doesn't need any registration at all. It just occurs, those rules around authorship and, and um, you know, uh, what rights people have are deemed by nature of the law. I've put confidential information there too because it, it's a common law, but it's, it's seen as part of IP. So the IP protects products of the mind and it's got a real economic focus. And if I could just walk you through copyright as an example of a law that um, has deeming provisions against any sort of uh, transaction or situation where an Indigenous knowledge transfer might occur. So uh, copyright introduces the notion of a copyright work. It has to meet criteria. Uh, like, for example, a story would have to come in a literary work and it must be an original form. Sorry, it must be in an original work in material form that it has to be written down. And automatically there we're seeing an oral culture not benefiting from protection. It's got rights there that are listed. Um, very, you know, the right of rep reproduction to communicate it to the public, for example. They're rights that are about sharing it. So it's, it's made for that. There's nothing really about protecting, um, you know, that cultural transfer. Um, who owns copyright? It's the author, the one who creates the material form. There are some exceptions there, like the employer might own things that employees create. Uh, how long does it last for? 70 years after the death of the author, and that is the material form author. There's another section of copyright, which refers to uh, subject matter other than works. And you can see there it has rules too, which sort of follow along um, the same as works. But if you could just see there, the, the rule is who owns it. It's the maker of the work. For a sound recording, it's um, the person who will be make, making the sound recording, unless it's, you know, um, a live recording of an expression of culture and, you know, films are owned by the maker. And there are rules around who, how long that owns for. And then there's moral rights introduced in 2000. And they address things like the moral right of attribution, 
and that's good for Indigenous people because it's the connection to, you know, be named. But it only that right is only for individuals, not for clan groups. And then, um, you know, the right of integrity is there, and that's not to have your work, um, you know, subject to uh, derogatory treatment, and that's where it's altered and changed up. Important right. But um, there's a difference there if you look at the way IP and ICIP line up together. So an IP right is like a copyright right. We saw it needs, an, it's protecting an expression and you need that material form. But ICIP, which is like uh, practised, your walking country, not protected. So when someone might interview someone talking about their story, um, they might be writing it down and they will become the authors of the story. It's happened a lot to Indigenous people and there's been books written about their stories, films, what have you, and it can be really hard to tell those Indigenous people that they don't own those stories anymore and the author of the material form gets to say who can reproduce it, make a movie out of it. They can also, um, you know, basically make money out of it. Uh, Individual rights are there. They're looking for an individual author, but communal rights are not covered, uh, except there have been a re recent case, or well, uh, the 19, late 1990s, there was a case that looked at communal rights and introduced the notion of a fiduciary duty being owned by a uh, copyright owner um, to the clan group. But IP, uh, economic rights, ICIP is cultural. IP, you can actually assign it in writing and ICIP is handed down through um, cultural practice um, and there's that limited duration. Now, IP will end. And once it's in the public domain, you can really use it without there being any legal recourse by the creators because time's up. But for Indigenous people, an old song or an old story that might have passed out of that copyright period still uh, is part of the ICIP that that cultural practice of giving consent. So now we've looked at the problems. How have um, we looked at the solutions? Now I'm showing here some of the key developments that have occurred in Australia and internationally for this problem. And it's not a new one. Uh, 1974, you know, um, one Jacques Marika called for changes there. He was on the Australia Council Aboriginal Arts Board. And, you know, I was talking there, and people probably know, those of you who know the old $1 note, there was a story there. So it just, the whole list goes right down to things that are happening today and um, calling for new laws. And there hasn't been really any legal developments, really. And internationally, you see the column with some of the early models. This problem is not just an Australian one. It is internationally, too, for traditional knowledge um, sort of uh, countries and uh, other world Indigenous um, peoples. So you can see there, there's been a lot of talking about this and we're still ending up with this um, story happening. Uh, the Australian government now is again looking at whether or not to introduce new laws. IP Australia has commissioned a study what a standalone law might look like, but it's still uh, very much a problem. The um, the only real sort of legal document is the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, which um, Australia, um, post signing, um, agreed to be bound to. And it has an article here that recognises that Indigenous people have the right to maintain, control, protect, and develop their cultural heritage, traditional knowledge, and traditional cultural expressions. And it says they have the right to control it, just like intellectual property. And we don't um, have this coming in as a law, like a Copyright Act in Australia, but it is influential. Um, Canada actually is uh, just recently released a draft piece of law because they're going to enact these rights. Australia is still um, using this um, as aspirational, but I feel that it's a good document for everyone to look at because many Indigenous Australians were involved in its uh, development but it is a really good uh, outline of um, Indigenous people's um, call for their rights. And um, it's within all of this framework that we got to thinking about um, if there's going to be new, no, 
no laws, what can be done? So it's protocols that could possibly set a pathway because protocols are uh, appropriate ways of dealing with uh, relationships, um, using um, and interacting with people and sharing knowledge. So um, it, it could be a, a, a model that could be flexible. It, re it could reflect these customary law and cultural obligations. It could recognise free prior informed consent by um, being outside of the law. It is more ethical, I guess, in its good faith. And um, if, if people are willing to engage and there's mutual respect for it, and they can be binding if they're used in contracts or if they become industry standards. And um, it's binding at least against parties to those agreements. And over time, if people use them and lots of people use them and they become standards that people know, they are um, quite good to um, recognise uh, things that aren't recognised in law and possibly be a pathway to law. And so began True Tracks protocols. And um, we were involved in the writing of a lot of uh, sort of um, looking at the gaps in the law and then trying to do guides and protocols for people where there were gaps. And uh, the True Tracks protocol developed. And there's 10 principles in it. They go one to 10, but they interlink and they're not just like sequential. For people working and engaging with Indigenous people, think about these as all the things you need to plan when you're developing a project. And maybe it's good to just have it against your project um, plan to think about how you might, within a project, uh, fulfil these obligations. So if you look at respect, that's recognising Article 31 straight up that Indigenous people uh, have the right to their Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. And it's sometimes looking at where you, th you think it might not need to be um, involved, but uh, you might miss that. So really, really think about that. Two is self-determination, and that is involving Indigenous people in the key decisions, authorship, co-design, advisory groups, all of that sort of thing. So thinking they, it's their culture, how do we enact this right? Three is consent and consultation, and the standard is free prior and informed consent. So it's thinking about how you give Indigenous people enough information about a project, the benefits and the risks, its irreversibility, the scope. Uh, how might you do that? Who are the people you speak to? Um, are you going to get written consent? Or uh, how do you get consent from a group, for example? Four is interpretation. So Indigenous people have the right to be the primary guardians and interpreters of their Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. So that's thinking about voice, whose voice is captured, whose gaze, and uh, projects that really enable Indigenous voices are important to, um, uh, you know, we want to have more of that. Five is cultural integrity, thinking about the context in which the uh, Indigenous cultural material is, is being um, either, uh, you know, re-interpreted um, or put. So it's not in its cultural context anymore. It's outside and you, you've got to think about, has anything changed um, that may harm the integrity or, and spirit of that cultural material? Six is secrecy and privacy, and that's the right of Indigenous people to keep secret and sacred things secret and sacred, but it's also privacy of individuals because a lot of Indigenous people um, as individuals get asked to share stories or I've been speaking to a lot of elders who just are constantly asked to share their stories and um, they um, don't have any control of how it's edited. And so the privacy of individuals is important to think about. And then we move to uh, seven attribution. And this is wider than the moral right of attribution. It's thinking about how you might attribute the group so that connection remains. You know, I was telling you the story about how there's a lot of objects and ancestral remains that are all, and we don't know where they're from, the provenance is not known. We want to keep that attribution, the name of the people, the organisation and the cultural groups. And um, people are using traditional custodians' notices 
like a you know you see the copyright imprints on the front of books. Uh, there's a lot of movements to capture traditional um, custodians notices when there's publication of um, indigenous cultural and intellectual property. And then there's maintaining, oh sorry, I've missed an important one, number eight, benefit sharing. And that's the right of indigenous people to share in the benefits uh, of their cultural and intellectual property. And that um, can be monetary or non-monetary, non but um, it should be considered at the outset. So. How are you um, paying people for their, not, uh, for their participation? They're not just informants. They might be co-designers, you know, or, um, you know, someone, a group, someone might speak to a group that ends up um, being a pattern for new medicine. There should be benefit sharing in that uh, arrangement or co-ownership of the pattern, for example. Nine is maintaining Indigenous culture, culture and that's thinking about archiving or keeping what you've recorded so that Indigenous people can link to it. Um, there's a legacy um, issue of a lot of things that are collected now that we hold in archives that, uh, you know, films, we don't know where they're from. People need to um, go through them and work out if it's suitable for it to be used in terms of it um, not having sacred material, but also who is that community. But if we can think of now um, giving those, um, you know, writing down those details, um, maybe even returning material to people, copies, so you maintain those links with Indigenous people, um, I think it's very strong. And it also speaks to the fact that once you're engaging and working in, with Indigenous people and having these projects, you're actually building a, a, a long-term relationship. Um, you may, you know, records that will be important for those people. So it's always good to look for mutual benefits. Ten is recognition and protection. So we're thinking there about using the laws, protocols, contracts to give effect to Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. And um, that's developing every day with um, the amendments um, people are making to their general release forms and including uh, recognition that the speaker does have rights to what they're saying and getting a licence rather than, set, um, you know, owning the written material. So there are ways that, that can be done and I think the movement to have written protocols, Indigenous cultural and intellectual property protocols, uh, has been a very strong way that the recognition and protection measure has um, come about. So, um, as a movement, I think that the protocols in all areas should take place. The Australia Council was an early adopter. The arts sector was an early adopter. And that was uh, led by Cathy Craigie, who uh, was the director at the time. She really wanted to have these protocols written down. The first iteration of the protocols were like a sort of a very small um, uh, A5 size. and. Um, it is now um, morphed into the, the big red book, which you can get online. But the Australia Council uses the True Tracks protocols through its, um, to guide um, collaborations, uh, exhibitions, um, performance projects, you know, all types of projects. You can see them listed there. Uh, literature, community, multi-arts, experimental arts and event-based projects, and they're using the protocols to guide people to uh, plan at the stage of putting together a proposal that will be funded, and um, it goes to the Australia Council and they're going to look through how is the project um, thought out, how it will respond to these protocols. And then they make them uh, binding on the recipient when you sign the funding agreement, so it's, it's a way that they have thought about um, you know, filling the gap in the law. And the protocols have been very successful. Uh, I think, um, you know, this is, as I said, the third rendition of them, but used, um, you know, quite widely. There are some also in um, film, um, the Screen Australia ones. But um, I wanted to share you that because um, you can see how, as a model, outside of there being a, a specific law, and I still think there needs to be specific law, if we're going to give self-determination and recognise Indigenous people um, have this cultural practice, 
we can use a framework that will in involve protocols and looking at intellectual property, how I mentioned copyright um, has those um, deeming provisions, knowing that and working with that and using contracts, you can start to form a framework about how organisations or you know, industries can respond to the gap in the law. And that uh, could be on the pathway to make protocols a national standard, using contracts, it's about licensing rights so that Indigenous people might be the owners of that knowledge in a legal sense and they can licence it. And we use IP law to uh, best ownership or um, enable those rights to be very clearly set out in written agreements. And the protocols can be specific. And these protocols, I should say, they're um, quite high level. Um, people would think also about the practice guidelines that would take into account in each area. It might be people who work in heritage, thinking about how their practice might come into line with these. It might be architects or designers or fashion designers or, um, you know, urban developers that could use this as a framework. And um, it could be, you know, a model that develops, um, that deals with that cultural interface. And to date, it's been used in a lot of um, places. I'm, I'm showing here some Indigenous use of it. And I'm, you probably know some of these um, great organisations like Bangara Dance Theatre, who um, for many years has, uh, you know, just um, been an outstanding Australian uh, arts organisation, but it, um, in bringing together its productions using protocols to respect the traditional knowledge that uh, it, it incorporates in its production, and that could be from music to the storyline to the art that's depicted on the stage. And uh, NASA does it too. Um, we've worked with the Kimberley Land Council as well. Uh, for them, they have so many people coming to want to do research on country. They want to take samples of country. They want to exchange that knowledge, but um, they've set up a system where the Research Ethics and Access Committee has now got a, a protocol that says you have to tell us what you're using it for, and, and then we do a deal about um, how that information is shared and you give us a copy of it. You know, you might benefit share, but you give us a copy of us to put in our archive so we get to collect and keep it. And then there's some other things there. I'm showing a picture there of Michaela Jade, who some of you may know um, is an Indigenous woman who's doing really well in the tech industry. And um, her work has been to uh, really interpret um, Indigenous knowledge through tech, and she uses all sorts of technology to give Indigenous perspectives to land, um, culture, and uh, has been winning awards. There's also institutions and, uh, who are adopting True Tracks, and national ones at that, and the National Museum of Australia uh, has an Indigenous engagement and cultural rights policy which embodies the True Tracks principles. They added another one to their um, protocols which was the right of Indigenous people to um, uh, um, basically seek, um, like, um, to, to um, uh, make um, some claims or respond to how they're dealing with it and seek feedback, which I think is pretty bold of them to do that, but they're constantly wanting to get that feedback on their practice. And so a principle 11 was um, included. But you can see the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences there. And our good friend Marcus Hughes was um, one of the um, uh, heroes to get that through. And um, it's a very comprehensive uh, protocol. And some of the other um, institutions there that are embodying um, true tracks. So if more do that, it will mean that we're building um, this uh, national system that can really fill the gap in um, the, the space. And so that goes to, I mean, I've had a long career of thinking about this, which culminated in me writing a PhD and then a book, which is this one here, True Tracks. And um, the story of that, why I called it that, um, was because um, when I first finished my law degree and started practising, I was so pumped, thinking, oh, I'm going to tell Indigenous people all of this. And people would get me out to speak about the rights. And um, when I went up to Cairns, 
uh, I was giving a workshop on the law and I was really aware that I was telling the people this, but there were also the gaps. And I felt a little bit like it's not all good. I'm a little bit of a, like, a, they had such belief that they said, Terry's gonna come and tell us all of this. And I did, and they, um, they a journalist came and um, did a story on um, the workshop. And the next morning when I got up, I was staying in a hotel. I was heading off to the Torres Strait, going to take a plane up there. And a journalist came to um, do the story. And when I woke up, it was early in the morning, but the, there was a paper. You know, when you open the door and you walk out, you put the paper. And there was my face looking up at myself. And it, had, it was on the front page and it said, cultural crusader. And I was going, oh, my God, how embarrassing. I'm just so glad I'm getting out of here and no one will see me. And I sort of jumped off um, to get on the plane. You know, I threw the paper back in the um, hotel. And um, then when I got on the plane, I thought, thank God, going up to the Torres Strait. And then, of course, every person on the plane had the paper because, you know, <laughs> the hostess has gone through. And I was just sat down and the woman that sets me said, you're that woman, you're that, you're that girl, you're doing intellectual property law. And um, I said, yeah, but um, it's really, really hard. You know, I can't. I can't change everything, there's a lot of expectation. And she said, well, that's okay, just keep your tracks true and other people will follow. And that's the story of where I, I learned to be, I guess, at home with that and my role as a lawyer that was paving this way because it's not just me, it's you. And you can all work together to uh, build the true tracks for better protection of Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry. That was a really amazing discussion and presentation by you. I think um, you certainly have found your true tracks and have done an amazing job in communicating that so broadly across Australia and, and beyond. So thank you for that. We've got some time for some questions, if you don't mind. And uh, we've got two roaming mics in the room, I think, uh, Charlotte and Ben. Am I right? OK, has anybody in the room got a question they would like to ask? If you have, please put your hand up. Yes, just wait for the microphone, if you don't mind. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more from a um, point of view about heritage consultants or in the heritage sphere wanting to gather stories and be able to tell those stories as part of conservation interpretation um, to truth tell and share those stories. Can you talk about True Tracks in relation to that kind of scenario? Sure, thanks for that question. It is uh, something I guess heritage consultants, but all writers of, uh, would need to consider. And I think it's um, probably to look at that, uh, the benefit of the work that you're doing um, in collecting the story and that it, it has some mutual benefit, the person who's giving it. But you might need to look at um, uh, how you interpret it. Some People might get it to be checked, but um, you know whether or not that's possible. You want to really make sure that people know that it might be published or where it will go, and um, using forms would be a good practice to uh, detail that consent. And I think you know, can you think of mutual benefits that might go back with it being recorded? It might be within your process to create a sound recording, or maybe. I think a lot of people use the the uh, film. You know, you're filming people, which creates a, a cultural, a copyright work, uh, subject matter other than work. So I always get people to think: Can you give people copies um, so that they might uh, have access to it? Um, and there is a question also around whether they should be paid, and paying them for that involvement um, in um, sharing that story. And of course, the other thing is to think of um, going back to see where did that end up and 
you know, maybe thinking about, well, I used your story in here and it, it was for this benefit and pe people like that. I think, um, yeah, just making sure it's clearly known. And then the other thing to take note of is if you use it again and it's used in a different context, um, you might need to go back and think about, oh, look, I used it for that, but this is another thing. You've got to think about is that an appropriate context and you may need to go back, which then gets you to think about in the long term, these long term um, recorded pieces of Indigenous knowledge that we have, you might need to think about who do I go back to if that person has passed away or, you know, those sort of things come up. So um, I guess it's also the message is to keep really good records. Thanks for that question. Do we have any other questions in the room? Yes, one at the back there, Charlotte. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that um, great talk, um, Terry. <clears throat> this is a, a, a very general um, question. Um, um, I'm thinking, um, you know, that the, the, the concept of copyright and um, ownership of materials and so on is, is, has to be very much at the heart of Western society. And, you know, in the colonial context, a lot of colonialism sort of clearly involves putting a monetary value, for example, on something which previously didn't. Um, and we could think of land as being a prime example of that. So what um, indigenous cultural um, copyright and um, ownership and concepts like um, shared benefit, uh, communal ownership, non-material uh, culture, um, you know, really um, counter that Western conception of property. Do you, do you see any sign that the movement, you know, that, that you're involved in and, and that other people involved in this, um, in this respect is gradually having an impact on the way a place like Australia is thinking about not just indigenous property, but property in general and copyright in general and sort of ownership in general. Do you see that, any sign of that kind of happening? Um, possibly, um, but I want to say that indigenous people traditionally shared, shared, you know, ochre and traded. So it is not just a thing that happened on colonisation that there was a benefit. It might not have been, you know, uh, cash as we know it now, but there was an exchange. So uh, Indigenous people were very entrepreneurial for many, many years. Um, that's how we survived. There was lots of trade happening and it was with other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander groups and even, you know, the Macassans came up to the north. So there was a lot of that. Uh, I think that the systems that are reacting to a collective copyright uh, ownership are probably already here. If you look at the collecting societies that have worked together to do that and, you know, um, the, the rights when people are using other people's works and all that, they're already here. And also um, Indigenous people in response to land have developed systems where their uh, Aboriginal corporations are owning uh, jointly. And then it becomes a question of their governance systems, of how they deal with that. And more and more, you know, the concept of setting up trusts that re res um, give back through benefits. You know, it might not just be um, everybody gets X amount of money, but we might be building a ranger centre or, um, you know, children are going to um, be, be given opportunities to go to university. So those sort of things are already here. And perhaps that's being influenced, uh, that may influence the wider use. It might already even be here. But I, I don't think that we should think that um, Indigenous people um, should not... Uh, it's not ec economic. I think that the economic right is a strong one for Indigenous people. And the systems, if they 
or as a group feel like that they can work together and um, you know, set up businesses in tourism, in uh, agriculture, it might be in tech and carbon or you know, uh, hydrogen or whatever, those sort of things are really going to be uh, the basis for Indigenous people to get out of uh, and, and really be um, leaders in the Australian economy. And uh, the, there's growing uh, land and seas that are within the Indigenous estate. And that estate is land and seas, but knowledge is so embedded and interconnected with land and seas. So we're going to see this more and more and more for Indigenous people to be calling for, you know, Indigenous cultural and intellectual property rights. Thank you, Terry. I have a question here, which is a terrific one, I think. What advice do you have for any organisations who realise that perhaps they haven't been aligning with ICIP protocols in the past? How do they start to repair? That's a good question because I, I don't think... Um, you don't need to... It's good to admit that. I, I love that people are coming out and saying we, it wasn't good practice, but now we want to uh, change that. So um, the legacy stuff may need to be dealt with, but you can start by looking at the protocols and how you're going to implement it and embed it in the way you do things. And, you know, not just uh, a tick the box at the end of something, but how it might be embedded in the way that you do business. And that way can um, really change, change things. And you can turn yourself from being someone who wasn't so much good at the practice to being a real advocate. So um, it's, it's good that someone can admit that. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I agree. Anybody else? I will take one more question. Go ahead. Um, kind of following on from that, is there anything that us regular Joes can do to kind of help speed this process along and, and um, turn these into industry standards? Um, oh, thank you, Joe. Um, <laughs> first of all, Joe, you should buy my book. No, <laughs> no, um, it's a really good question because you can do things and it's, it's like even um, unlearning and, you know, it's challenging because we went through school systems that taught us this thing. So already by coming here and learning it and then the, the lens that you now bring into the way that you do your work has changed, I hope, and it might cause you to, you know, just, you know, bit by bit, um, think of different ways of doing that, that recognise, um, you know, giving voice to Indigenous people. It might be employing an Indigenous person or have a collaborator or uh, work closely with an Indigenous organisation, and uh, that way you can uh, make change. But, um, yeah, it's really important to um, not just... Um, uh, you know, take the voice or whatever, but enable the voice of Indigenous people. And, um, yeah, you, you can do that individually or through your organisation, and then you can also advocate it at an industry level through if you're, you know, in um, associations that have codes or protocols, you can really advocate for that to, to pick up. But then if we go back to my original quest, uh, when Our Culture, Our Future came out, which was for there to be a new law, well, that's something that you could look at too. There's currently an inquiry on and the Productivity Commission is looking at visual arts, uh, in Indigenous visual arts industry, but I mentioned the IP Australia um, work, which will come out. So it's also to assist and advocate for recognition um, legally as well. Thank you, Terry, and thank you to everybody for coming along this evening, particularly to SLM, ANU and GML Heritage. This is um, the fourth in our First Nations speaker series, and I think Terry Janke has helped us understand the nuanced and sensitive ways and um, the steps that we can all take in terms of helping to protect and acknowledge and respect Indigenous and cultural heritage uh, property through our everyday work and actions. So thank you, Terry, and thank you to the audience here and online. Good night.
Good night.